Hey guys, Ryan here from onproperty.com.au, your daily dose of property education and inspiration. And today I'm really excited to have with me Jane Slack Smith from the Ultimate Guide to Renovation. Now, Jane has been in the industry for a long time. Uh, from her website, I found out that she started her property portfolio 13 years ago. She's been teaching renovation for over eight years. Um, if you guys read any of the investor magazines, she's always in them. She knows a great deal about renovation, and today, Today I'm here to pick her brain and to learn more about it, um, investing in property and renovating property. Thanks for coming today, Jane. Hey, thanks a lot, Ryan. Um, so basically, give us a bit of your story in case people don't know who you are. I'm guessing most people will know who you are if they've read the magazines and stuff, but in case they don't, uh, who are you and what's your story? Look, you know, I guess I'm, uh, I'm pretty atypical to... Um, you know, most people in the industry who are, you know, telling people about property investing because I, I really was reluctant to start investing and it was my husband who said, you know, we really should be doing something with our money and uh, and I was a mining engineer at the time so I spent, you know, 15 years in the mining industry as an explosives expert and, you know, every single day I was kind of like assessing risk. So I was looking at risk and looking at ways to minimise risk because obviously if you get it wrong, you kind of lose a hand. So, you know, it was about uh, doing doing it right. And um, you know, I, I remember sitting in New Zealand reading Rich Dad Poor Dad and he said, do you work for your money or does your money work for you? And I thought, crap, you know, I'm going to work every day, I'm working hard, I'm earning this money, I come home, I spend it and a bit more, I should be doing something with this. So I was, I was really anti the white picket fence kind of mentality because I thought I was living in mining towns and I thought the only property that you bought was really your home and I didn't want to have, you know, the home in the mining town because I, I saw myself moving on from that. And um, so I started doing the stock exchange course and I thought if I could trade shares, this would be really great. And so you know, I, I paper traded for about six months and I was going backwards and I'd finally do, as every good engineer does, all these Excel spreadsheets and I'd map out what this company was doing and they'd change the board or they'd do something and all of a sudden all my analysis had gone out the window. So I got really frustrated then I met my my husband Todd, and he was from New Zealand, and he was he was an entrepreneur from a very young age, and had you know a, a lawn mowing business and different things, and and he had met this guy who had said, you know, can you come? He was like 24, and he said, can you come and mow my lawn? And he did the job, and the guy said, well, I've got six other properties, could you mow those too? <laughs> And you have all these properties. And he said, you know, the first one's the hardest. Once you have the first one, you create some equity, you can buy again. So he kind of had something in his mind that, you know, um, property helped you make money. And his dad was always carting um, the, the family around from home to home and they were doing up the home and, and buying a bigger home. And so, you know, we got thinking about it and that's when we kind of jumped in in 2000 and, and went to all the free two-hour seminars because we didn't have any money to spend on all the fancy ones and, and uh, you know, I read all these books and it got to the point for me that I, um, I after about the fifth or sixth seminar and book, I kind of stopped listening to the content because you know, I mean, if we're honest, there's not much new in property, right? You know, every now and then someone goes and buys overseas and or, you know, wraps something, but there's not much new. And um, I was really listening to the stories that people were sharing that were, you know, I lost everything and then I bought it, got it back again. And I wanted to know how they lost it. So I actually started going to seminars to learn about the mistakes people made because I thought if I can minimise my risk, like a good explosives engineer and understand all the risks and all the mistakes everyone else makes and I document them all and then I put in a plan how to not make that happen for me, then you know, I'm, I'm in a much better place to start investing and that's how I do it. Very interesting. I wouldn't say there's a lot of people that would go to those seminars and look just for the mistakes people made so they can minimise their risk. Most of them are looking to get rich quick or something like that. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What were some of those mistakes that people made? Can you highlight a couple? Oh, absolutely. Um, buying in the wrong location, not doing the research, listening to some fancy uh, salesperson um, who was really good at selling. And, you know, that's, that's mistakes people are still making. I mean, subsequently, you know, my journey moved on. I bought a lot of properties. I wanted to help other people do it. I couldn't get 
um, insurance protection to talk to people about helping them with properties back in 2005. So I, um, the only way I could do it, because financial planners aren't allowed to talk about property back then, they only in the last year have been allowed to, was um, become a mortgage broker to talk to people about property. So I started a mortgage broking business. And so the context of that comment is that I was talking to a lady yesterday who said, oh my gosh, you know, we just bought this property six months ago in uh, Queensland in an outer suburb of Ipswich. The sales guy was so good, he promised us everything and now we find it's going backwards, the, the town stopped, the train stopped going there, you know, there's no one who wants to rent or buy, we've just lost all our money and they, they were convinced to put it in a self-managed super fund. So the mistakes people were making way back then when I started researching, you know, nearly 15 years ago, people were making today. So buying in the wrong location, not doing the research, having the wrong, um, I guess, structure or entity. A lot of people go into joint ventures with their friends, you know, have a couple of glasses of red wine. It sounds like a good idea that we all get together and buy a block of units and do them up. Yeah. Um, or they, you know, there's a builder and they'll go into JVs with them and, you know, it all ends in tears. I, I mean, you know, I've been writing loans now for 10 years and um, I could count on three fingers, I think, three JVs that I've seen been successful. So, wow. you know, I just, <laughs> for me, it's just like learn the mistakes other people have and don't do it. So, you know, no JVs, do your research, know where you're buying, don't try to be fancy, time the market. I spoke to this lady back in 2006 who told me Sydney was way too expensive. She was going to wait until the property prices came down because there was going to be a crash. And I spoke to her this year in 2014 and she's still waiting for the crash. She said, the $450,000 homes yeah. I was looking at then are now seven fifty. dollars What am I going to do? I'm like, yeah. what's your money well, done in the bank? Let's um let's touch on that because I think what you've said is so important. Like, firstly, um, do your own research is so important that people actually go out and do it. But you're talking about not timing the market, and a lot of people out there want to find the right area that's at the right point in time that's going to go up. And truthfully, they're very difficult to find, even if you have access to all the data. Um, <laughs> So what are some things that people can do? Let's say that they are interested in purchasing a property or if they're interested in, in renovating a property. What are some of the things they can do to research an area so they don't end up like someone who bought out the back of Ipswich and got done for all their money? Exactly. Well, look, I, I'll take you through an example of yesterday. I had a, a client ring up um, and uh, you know, they just wanted a 30-minute discovery session with me to just talk about their next step. and. They were 57, 58, they have a home in a good area in Sydney, the home's gone up in value, they've paid their non-deductible debt down and they're saying, you know, we've got this great big home that we don't really need and we've gone block of land, we know if we buy or sell we're going to, you know, have some costs. So we're thinking of adding a granny flat on and there's been these three great granny flat salesmen that have come out and shown us how we can do it and it's all going to be easy. And um, or we can knock it all over and put a duplex on. And they said, we know our area, we know it really, really well, so we know this works for us. And so really quickly I pulled up some, some quick information. So first of all, I went to investsmart.com.au, investsmart.com.au, and I went to the property section and I put in um, the area and I came up and said, well, let me just test how, how well you do know the area. What is the, the um, percentage of renters in the area? And they said, oh, yeah, there'd be a few. I was like, well, it's 20%. And what is the percentage of people who rent units, i.e. the 60 square metre granny flat you're going to put on the back of your house? And they said, 7%. So we've now got this whole population in this area and we're down to 7% that potentially would be happy to rent in the, your backyard. And, and then, so tell me, you know, the age of the, the demographic of the area. And they're like, oh, you know, 40. And I'm like, well, the average age is like 52. So how many average people at 52 want to rent a unit in the back, your backyard? And it's like, well, you know, it's it's <laughs> the population in the area, there's more Indians and Chinese all the time and they always have their grandparents in the backyard, so it will work. I'm like, well, let's just have a look at the demographics here. The average is 52% Australian and there's 9% there's Chinese and 4% Indians. So now you've got 
20% down to 7% in a unit down to this tiny little percentage. We're talking about of the population of 20,000 in the suburb, we're talking about maybe like, you know, it was like 70 people who potentially, you know, uh, want to rent your unit and or, you know, your house and they're like, okay, so maybe we don't know the area. So, and then, you know, uh, it, just some simple questions about the demographic, does it suit the market, and you know, there's four, over 14,000 suburbs in Australia, and you know, knowing very, very clearly your goal. You know, if your goal is to have a passive income of $50,000 in 15 years' time, then I know because I've done the numbers that it's two investment properties at the average Australian house price will get you there, bought within the next five years with one renovation. I I know that. I've taken the Australian Bureau of Statistics numbers and average numbers and 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 done those calculations. So you know, all you need is two places. So if you're, if you know your goal, I need two properties that are going up by 7% per annum with a 4.5% rental yield, and I can afford $450,000, then 14,000 suburbs comes down to maybe 1,000 suburbs. And if you say, well, I also want to renovate, so therefore it has to be within my area, that might come down to, you know, 60 suburbs. And then of those 60 suburbs, you go, well, what's the median price of these well, I can't afford half of them, so there's 30 suburbs. So you're getting narrow and narrower based on your goals, the property investing strategy you have, and then the um, the buying criteria, which is how much you can afford. Is your strategy around putting a granny flat on, or developing, or renovating? Therefore, you know you have to find a property that suits those needs. So maybe on a corner, or maybe over 450 square meters, or or maybe um, you know an older style property that you can renovate, or knock one wall out and make you know a big family room. So you need to be really clear on those things before you even start looking at a property. So I think that's one of the big mistakes that people make is that they they kind of think I know my area. And they don't. They don't. They don't know yeah. what the infrastructure plans are. I mean, of my eight investment properties, every single one is next to a university and a hospital. Because I'm so low risk, I just want to make sure that there's constant employment and constant rental market if everything goes wrong. I think I want to touch on like going back. That was so interesting what you said because I think so many people get it wrong. And pe what people do is say, okay, well. You know, I want to make heaps of money. So, what's the best the best area to invest in? And so, I'm going to go out and read the magazines and find the hot spots, or you know, get the advice from whoever. But what you said is, um, I guess some would consider it a backwards approach, but it's an approach that I really like, which is set your financial goals first, and then work out well what fits within those financial goals. Then work out like, well, how do you want to invest? And then work out, you know, what sort of areas fit in with your investment goals and with the way you want to invest. And so you're really narrowing down your target market and you're then doing your research in there. I think that's a great way for people to um, fix that sense of overwhelm that we have because yeah. we all think, you know, the Australian property market's so big. What if I buy in the wrong area? How am I going to know where to buy? Well, if you know what your investment goals are and how you want to invest, you can narrow it down significantly. And that, Absolutely. I guess, gives you a smaller parcel to work with. Let's talk about the two properties and one renovation strategy sure. because that's one I've never heard before. I hear a lot of people talking about, well, buy 10 properties in 10 years and that's how you become financially yeah. free. Uh, I think a lot of people will be really excited about the fact that we can become financially free just off two properties. So can you talk about that more and are you talking about a house and an investment property or two investment properties? Yeah. So. So basically what I did is uh, one of the things that has really driven me and the reason that I kind of went from you know explosives engineering to mortgage broking and, and property education was you know I looked at my parents and I looked at the the retirement income that they were going to retire on they you know sacrificed having a home so that they could send us to good schools to have a good education so they were dependent on the um, uh, retirement what do you call it government <laughs> Pension, the pension, the, word, the P word, pension, and so you know that's less than like thirty five thousand dollars. So I knew that that um, I had to do that, and a lot of people are kind of that's that's the that's the end for them. You know, this is, they're going to work for you know the greatest Australian crime I reckon is working for you know forty hours a week for forty years to end up on less than forty grand. A year, you know, that's that's just mad. It's not fair. So, so I was like, well, how can I make this really simple? You know, I've built, I built really fast, and you know, we were on good incomes, really fast 
um, a portfolio so we didn't have to do anything ever again and we haven't bought anything for years because we don't need to and I'm not one of those property investors like get out there and buy all the time you know because if you get it right in my mind is okay here's I'm going to share with you Ryan this is this is my okay. kind of secret mantra that goes on for me is that I uh, there's a scene in um, Forrest Gump where uh, where Forrest goes down to the mailbox and he says, Bubba said he'd look after my investments and he invested in a, in a uh, fruit company and they yeah. sent me a letter and he opens up this, this letter part, yeah. and it's got, yeah, it's got Apple on it and it says, you don't need to worry about money anymore. I'm like, that's good and that's what I want to create for people. So, you know, my theory is if you buy the right properties in the right area with the right finance structure within a short period of time, forget about it, get on with your life and in 15 years you put a million bucks in the bank. So. How I worked that out was when I was writing the book, Your Property Success with Renovation, Two Properties, One Renovation, a Million Dollars in the Bank back in 2012, I grabbed the census figures. So the average male was on a $74,000 and the average female was on $59,000 and the median house price was $444,000 and the median home loan was at $384,000 and you know we had a credit card of about 5000 and we had like $500 for a car loan, which is kind of like typical mum, dad, kids life, you know? Yeah. And so what I did is I said, well, what can they afford on those incomes? So if we took um, their home to a 90% loan to value ratio, took out the funds to cover a purchase price and the cost of purchase, around about $65,000, they took out the money to do that or or a 5% deposit I think was put took out the money and they bought one investment property year one one investment property worth the average 444 and they bought in an area that was going up in value so you know the long term 100 year growth is um, about 7% and talking to John Edwards uh, from Residex he believes that you know characteristically what we're going to see in the future years is what the long term growth over the last 20 years has been which is around about that so you know take a 7% growth in the third year, you've created enough equity in that investment property, so it goes from about 444 to about 540, um, to pull that money out and do a renovation. So my cosmetic renovations, I proclaim, should take about 10% of the value. So you spend about 55,000 fixing up, you know, cosmetic. We're doing kitchen, bathroom, floorboards, lights, you know, painting, bit of landscaping and adding value. So for every dollar you spend, you should be getting a dollar back. So if you spend 55000 you should be getting 110 on the value of that. And then leave it. Don't take the equity straight away. Just leave it and put the rent up because I really, I'm very, very strong on the fact that you shouldn't compromise on cash flow or um, growth. You should have both. So you know, you definitely need cash flow to be able to hold a portfolio, but you also need growth to grow it and then get out. You know, there's no point in having 10 properties making you 10 bucks a week if they're still worth $500,000 in 10 years time. Once you sell them, you got nothing. So, you know, you need growth and you need cash flow. So, end of the fifth year, take the equity out of the first property um, and buy a new investment property. Now, by that time, obviously, based on 7%, house prices have gone up as well. So, you're buying in with a 10% deposit and stamp duty that you've taken out of the first um, investment property and that's it. Stop. Get on with life, you know. This is a five-year kind of plan, and then ten years later, growth. You've bought in the right areas. You've done all the research. It's not like hope and a prayer. Let's hope this one pulls off. It's about getting the right property in the right area and doing that research. And um, ten years time, you know, after that five year of initial building your portfolio, if you go and sell your portfolio down and you pay the capital gains tax, which a lot of property educators kind of conveniently forget, and pay the selling costs then there's a million dollars left over that you can put in the bank and at a 5% return there's $50,000 a year, which doesn't mean you have to give up your job. Could mean that you go part time, could mean that you can follow a passion, could mean that you have a holiday every year and you know have a support the kids wedding or pay for the kids education. It's about having a freedom of choice. And yep. um, and if you go to my website yourpropertysuccess.com.au there's a little picture of exactly how that looks, you know, one property in year 1, one property in year 3 sorry, renovation year three, one property in year five, forget about it. Then open up the letter that says, hey, you don't have to worry about money anymore. And that's, <laughs> for me, you know, it's not about, it's not about fancy chasing granny flats or developments or NRAS or off the plan or buying in the US. It's just about meat and potatoes, typical properties that people want.
Yeah, I like that strategy because it's a fact. It's basically anyone could do that. You know, like anyone in their mind can think, okay, two properties that's manageable. When you read Steve McKnight's book and he's purchased 130 <laughs> properties, you're like, oh in my. Oh. Yeah, I just, I just having a heart attack slash no. you know, brain aneurysm. Um, but you know, two properties purchased over the space of five years doing one renovation are uh, definitely achievable for most yeah. Australians. I like that strategy. Let's talk. Um, let's go more into about renovations because I know that's what you specialize in. Um, sure. What are some important things that people should look for in a property, like that first property they're buying that they're looking to renovate? What yep. are we specifically looking for? Is anything different to what we'd be looking for otherwise? Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, actually, it's funny because last night I was um, invited to the block as a um, a special guest of one of the sponsors. So there's about 50 of us there, and we got to go look through the entire block, and it's finished. You know, they finished three weeks ago, but I think they've got three more weeks of room reveal. So it was interesting, and in actually talking to the participants and and looking at the rooms, and and it, you know, it's a it's a on a really busy street with a tram rumbling out the front and you know if it wasn't the block and it wasn't being marketed and the, the camera company, the camera you know, channel set nine was actually going to be footing the bill for it all, it's not somewhere where you'd buy. So you know I think um, the thing is around renovating is there's a couple of mistakes that people make. You have to have the right property to renovate and you know I've got I, my entire property investing strategy that I've developed is called the Trident strategy because I'm kind of I'm really low risk, you know. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I don't want to have one way to make money renovation in in a market. I want to have three ways. So if Plan A really stuffs up and I get it all wrong, I've got B and C to fall back on. So my Trident strategy is buy below the market, and that's about intimately getting to know the market or buying of someone who doesn't know the market or in distressed state. So in the Australian property market at the moment. You know, it's really hard to buy below the market, but it was really hard in 2006. It was really hard in 2001, and I did it on both of those occasions. Uninterested yeah. purchases of uh, sellers, sorry. So one wouldn't even open up the rooms in in this house to let people have a look through. So you know, it was kind of it was uh, you know two of the room the four bedrooms would be rented to students and they all had locks on the doors and so the students wouldn't open the doors to show what was in the bedroom so you kind of kind of had to do a bit of a flip man and a wish and a prayer to make the rooms were okay but we had the building inspection done all the rest of it was fine but um, the I think the the thing is that you know, buying below the market adding value in the medium term through renovation and then long term being in a growth area. So you've got three ways to make money. And it was interesting, I, I had one of my students in the Ultimate Guide to Renovation in March and we pushed him back, he successfully had renovated I think 11 properties and I pushed him back and said go and have a look, now you know having done the course how to, to assess a property if you actually made money. And he went back and, he, and he's, he went through all the analysis and said six of them didn't make money, I covered it up by capital growth. You know, yeah. So you know, there's, which is good in one way. If you really stuff up, you kind of still look like a champion. But I reckon you should have three ways to make money. So the thing that people get kind of miss in renovation, I think, is that they think of renovation as a strategy after they buy the property. So they're not looking at the property with the twist and the opportunities. And I think the absolute best way to add value through renovation is changing a floor plan and potentially adding a bedroom to increase rental yield. So having a, um, so for instance I assisted my sister in finding an 80 square meter two bedroom unit that could easily be converted into a three bedroom unit. She bought with a 95% loan to value ratio she had That's no money. She waited. So yeah. let me interrupt you there because that's really interesting. How do I think you're right? Like purchasing properties that you can change in some way that's going to add significant value. But how do how would the average person go about finding a property that they can add an extra bedroom onto it or um, you know improve the floor plan in some way? Because I think a lot of people starting out wouldn't even know what to look for. So are we looking at square meterage or what do we? How do you analyze it and work it, has it out? To has to be livable, so it's not like combine. It's not like putting a, a 
$2,000 plasterwood wall down the middle of a big bedroom and making it two bedrooms with single beds in it. It has to be fit for the market so that's why it's really important that you know what the comparable sales are. So we knew that there was an 80 square metre unit could be a two or three bedroom unit. So this is about you inspecting the area. So going out, having a look on Saturdays at other two or three bedroom units or other three to four bedroom houses. Understand what the uh, demographic for that area wants and requires in the idea of finishes, but also in the idea of size of, of bedrooms, uh, size of living areas. I mean, you don't want to be uh, like sacrificing a second living area if every other three bedroom house has a second living area. So you yeah. don't want to be creating the fourth bedroom if everyone only wants three bedrooms. And I it's think about it's knowing your area, isn't it? So if you're in the inner city, then people will probably be happy with a smaller, pokier three bedroom with one living room, one bathroom. Whereas people who are in um, the country or who are in, out in Campbelltown or something like yeah. that, if they've if they've got three bedrooms, they're expecting you know two living rooms and ensuite, a second bathroom, all this sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and I think it's um. The, one of the things people miss is for every 10 properties that I inspect in a suburb to get a feel for the ones I can buy, the ones that I'm renovating up to the quality of, I also then go and invest, I also then go and, and look at a, a rental property on the market and I'm listening to what the renters want and it might be, oh, it doesn't have a carport or there's no security or gee, I wonder if I can get Wi-Fi here. I don't know what you know. Foxtel. I'm listening to what the tenants after, but I'm seeing what my competition is, and I think people miss that, especially as investors. If if your end goal is to rent this property out, then find out what the renters want and what your competition is. So it intimately researching and knowing the area. You know, I wouldn't be whacking a, a you know fifth bedroom into a huge four bedroom area that is predominantly 60-70% owner occupied and that's what the, the the house is, you know, a four bedroom with two living areas. I wouldn't be making yeah. a five bedroom rental. So, you know, you really, knowing the area is this, is so important in part of the renovating or finding the right place to renovate. And so then... Really, really, is it about, rather than it, it's not... I think some people will listen to this and say, okay, well, I need to find a place where I can add a bedroom. But I, that's not what we're trying to say at all. I think what we're trying to say is know your area so well that you know what renters want and buyers want and then yeah. find a property that could be that but isn't that right now. So maybe that exactly. is an extra bedroom but maybe it's adding a living room or maybe it's an ensuite or a bathroom or um, more back dining area or something. It's about knowing the area and what people in the area want finding something that isn't that but could be that. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. And, you know, it's it's more advanced to add a bedroom but, you know, in some areas it might be taking a bedroom out and making a living area or it might be creating the deck in Queensland or it could be, you know, just looking at a real... I mean, we bought a unit that was just ugly as and and painted it and pulled once they pulled all the furniture out it was light and bright and lovely and as we're walking through these open homes people are going oh my god who would buy this it smells I'm like smell I can get rid of smell you know yeah. so um, it's it's kind of it's about seeing the opportunity and and that's with the property but in the suburb you need to know what streets to buy in so you can actually find out where the predominant owner occupiers live and the predominant renters live in a suburb so that there is um, I did spend like oh my gosh 18 weeks and oh how long was it? three months and about 18 emails and conversations with the census guys saying I know you used to be able to do this in the 2006 census information teach me how to do it in 2011 so I can teach my students and you know you can create a map that shows you exactly what streets the renters want to live in and then it's about looking at pricing disparity so if the difference between an unrenovated and a renovated house or unit is not a lot, there's no profit for you. Walk away from that suburb, you know, no questions asked. If, there, if, the, dis, if the disparity is great, you know, if there's a, going to be a $150,000 or $200,000 disparity and it's going to cost you $50,000 to do the renovation, then fabulous. There's disparity there for you to create some money for yourself. If there's an $80,000 differentiation and it's going to cost you fifty grand, like, why would you spend your time on it? So, yeah. 
you know, you need to be, Crispy, you need to be creating a dollar for every dollar you spend. So you need to be, you know, adding $100,000 in value. And if the comparable properties are getting only $80,000, there's no value there. So you need to be able to do that. And, and when I say there's no value there, the valuer turns up and says, how much is this property worth? Because I want to be able to pull equity out from the bank. So I want to be able to build my portfolio. If the valuer turns up and says, three comparable sales, which is what the bank needs, three comparable sales, um, Say that it's only eighty thousand dollars more, then you know that's that's what the bank's going to lend you against. So yeah. you haven't actually created a dollar for every dollar you've spent. So what's um the average person out there that doesn't have access to I don't know advanced software and stuff like that? How are they going to work out whether there is that disparity in an area or not? It's it's kind of legwork to some degree. So you know if you're looking at unrenov like I've got for my students I've got these spreadsheets that kind of you know the the columns kind of like what's unrenovated, what's renovated, what's partially renovated per square meter. So you've got per square meter. So all you need to do is create your own spreadsheet that says I'm looking at um, let's say I'm looking at Red Hill in Newcastle, and so you've got um, your inspections properties names in one column, you've got the predicted price and what they sold for in, in two other columns afterwards, so you're building up your own you know, database. Yep. You're then looking at things like, um, so you're going to be doing your, your other research, vacancy rates, days on the market, discounting, etc. You potentially will be able to find out information on the difference between two bedroom and three bedroom houses or units, so you, you want to get down to that level. And then you put down the size of the property, so you know, 800 square meters, 450 square meters, or whatever the property size is, and what the property went for, and if it's renovated or unrenovated. So you can start building up, you know, how much the cost per meter squared of renovated versus unrenovated is as well. And if you're ticking yeah. this is renovated and this is unrenovated, then you're building up your own information. You don't have to go and depend on the experts. You don't have to go and, um, you know, do all the research or buy the fancy software systems. Then I know, you know, there's um, Investor, real estate, real estate, inv real estate investor, real estate and Ripe House. I love Ripe House. You know, I'm, I mean, I use that quite a lot. I think it's really great. Um, so there's there's some opportunities. If you go to my website, um, investorschoice.com.au, I've actually got on that front page a calculator that is a borrowing capacity calculator that backs ends into if you say I'm looking in the Blue Mountains a house. It will take your purchase price from your borrowing capacity and actually come up with all the surrounding suburbs and the past 12 months and the last 10 year growth of all the surrounding suburbs and the suburbs that you're looking at. And if you click on one of the suburbs, it will take you to a map and shows you the houses on the property on the market at the moment. Oh, awesome! That sounds like know, a really great tool for people. I'm so excited. <laughs> It's taken a long time to develop, but you know, it's there's a lot of free stuff out there. And I mean, I'm all about educating people so they can do it themselves. So you know, go and and if you can't, like honestly, I look at um, the amount of time and effort that I put into buying property, and I know when you're here, and and I'm kind of over the hill a bit. Well, not over the hill in age wise, I hope, but over the hill a bit <laughs> in, in property buying wise. You know, you look back and you, you kind of like, gosh, you know, if I could have shortcut that, I could have been even further ahead. And I was, you know, dogmatic and I didn't have the money to employ a painter, so I was going to paint all my all my waking hours. I was painting, you know. So it took three months to paint a, a two, three story, six bedroom house when we had a painter come in and paint the exact same property next door in five days. So, you know, I kind of I look back now and I go, some of the things that I thought I was saving money on, I really wasn't. And one of the things was time. So it might take, take you six months to find a property. Now, if you're in Sydney at the moment, six months could be $100,000 in a new... I was going to say that. Six months could cost you 50 or or 100 grand. Uh, so I'd much rather, hand on heart, spend $10,000, go to a buyer's agent and say, here is my my goal, here is my, my property investing strategy, here is my buying criteria. Do not come to me with a property that does not fit one of these three things. Be specific and tell them what you want and for 10 grand they'll go and get it for you, you know, and usually within six weeks. So, yeah. you know, I, I definitely see there's opportunity if you have, you know, some of those that cash available and I understand if you don't own investment properties that's not cash tax deductible but if you do it is 
I know, speak to your accountant. But <laughs> you know, um, there is there is information out there that you can get. And as I said, there's investsmart.com.au domain real estate. You know, I use all of those, and I show people how to just use the free stuff, so that you don't have to go and pay for these fancy, you know. Um, analysis tools and I have clients come to me and they go I'm looking at a, a block of four units in in where was the one last week Moree and I'm looking at this uh, dual key occupancy in Toowoomba I'm like are you on real estate investor by some chance and putting in weird criteria <laughs> because you can't back to these weird areas that banks won't go into areas less than 20,000 you know population with a 90% land and you know they, they come out with such specific kind of you know, I'm chasing cash flow and only cash flow that I know the banks won't lend against that at the LVRs that they want. So, you know, you kind of have to balance that as well. Yeah. Oh, well, I think this has been really good. I, I came into this interview thinking, you know, we'll go and we'll talk about different renovation strategies and stuff like that. But I think what we've talked about is all the stuff to do before the renovation strategies, which is probably more valuable to a lot of people anyway, because I think that's where people get that massive sense of overwhelm is, you know, where do I look, where do I buy? And I think you talking about, um, you know, minimizing uh, the areas you're looking at by looking at what you actually want to achieve and what property investment strategy you want, you want to use is super helpful. And then going back to when you were talking about, you know, looking for those areas with disparity, uh, I think it's important for people to note that you know, there's no fancy software out there that's going to say, well, this suburb has a disparity of two hundred thousand dollars, and and this suburb has a disparity of fifty. Like, you need to minimise those suburbs, and then you kind of you need to do the legwork yourself to, because there's no software out there that I know of that says, well, this property sold for this much, and it was renovated to this standard, and that accounts yeah. for this. Like, it's never going to be accurate. Computers aren't that smart yet. Not yet. <laughs> I'm sure they will. I'm sure there will be eventually, and so to find that disparity, to find a property, you know that that needs uh, that doesn't have what the area wants, but that you can create is going to be super valuable for anyone um, looking to renovate. So I know that you run a course called the Ultimate Guide to Renovation. If anyone yeah. wants to check that out, go to onproperty.com.au forward slash reno, which is my affiliate link for that. Can you tell people now about that course and you know, why that's been so valuable to so many people? Look, we only release it twice a year, March and October, and it's only uh, open for enrolments for four days during that time. So once people are in, they're in. And I'm, I'm a bit different to other educators. Well, maybe not. Let's not no, you are. I like, I like your education style because you're not like, uh, here's, here's the exact strategy I use. This will always work for you or you should buy this property off me. Like, you're very conservative for people. You're very um, helpful to people who are property. new to the industry. <laughs> yeah. So I think, yeah, go on. Sorry. I think um, uh, the ultimate guide to renovation. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of. It was two years in the making. We like we actually go through and do an entire cosmetic renovation on a house, and then a whole structural renovation on a house, and case study it and show step by step what to do. So people who want the renovation stuff well and truly looked after. The first six of the 12 modules is about finding the property, defining your strategies, you know, the risk assessment tools. Um, I've actually negotiated a, a, a three-month um, uh, free access to Ripe House, which has almost got down to the pricing disparity and renovation stuff. I think if anyone's going to crack it, Ryan, it's going to be them. Um, Jacob. A, tra a trade card that uh, I had someone tell me last week they just saved 2500 off their renovation, so a discount trade card. So we, we've got all that kind of extra stuff. But the course itself is a video-based course. The reason that I say we're a little bit different is that I wanted it not to be some, you know, five, six, ten thousand dollar course people went off to on a weekend and, you know, hubby had to stay home with the kids and then you have to come back and convince them that's the right thing. It's something that the whole family has access to. It's it's online. You have access to the courses forever. Um, we have twelve Q and A calls. We actually have a private Facebook page and it's What's happening on that page is extraordinary. People are putting up plans of houses they're inspecting and everyone's coming in and saying, this is how you change the floor plan. So if you've got new people who don't know what to do, you know, it's kind of the place to put that information or, hey, this is my success story or I'm in the middle of plastering and should I use, you know, this type of cement or this type of cement. I saw one this morning, this lady's doing a deck and uh, she was asking which kind of deck 
cover to put on and in the next line someone has just um, negotiating a property and was using one of the, the checklists or the, the tools I have on uh, putting in a letter of offer and she was saying how do I amend this and everyone was coming in and, and telling her things. So you know the course itself is, is unique because we take it by the hand and we really want people's success. Like I I'd honestly want people to see that with, with two properties they can put a million bucks in the bank and forget about money. So um, being committed to just letting people in for four days a year, twice a year just means that we're, we're all focused on doing that. So um, the ultimate guide to renovation will be launching the beginning of October so people can pre-register through your link. Um, I'll be doing a, a webinar on the 25th of um, September uh, eight clock at night that people can register through your link as well which um, basically I go through that whole you know how can two, two properties get your million bucks in the bank and a bit about more about what I did but you know I, I don't think property investing should be hard I know Warren Buffett said you know if investing is exciting you're doing it wrong and uh, you know more meat, meat and potatoes you know just get it right once find out the mistakes that other people made learn from experts who've done it before you know, shortcut all the mistakes, just get it set up and then forget about it. That's what it's all about. Yeah, awesome. Well, I think you understated your course because I have seen um, the video about the inside and you do go into all the stuff we talked about today but in intense detail and step by step yeah. exactly how to do it, what tools to use, all stuff like that. And then in the obviously in the videos you go through exactly how to renovate and things to look for. But I like the idea of the Facebook group. I think that's cool. Oh, so that's great. because renovating is so um, property to property, so people can ask specific questions about the properties they're yeah. looking at. So if you guys want to get more information about that, uh, you can sign up for the free webinar on the 25th of September. You can sign up for that um, once this goes live. So just go to onproperty.com.au forward slash reno and you can sign up for that and learn more information. Um, and is there anything else we should let people know before we close this out? No, look, I really appreciate talking to, to you and your people and you know, if we can spread the message that it doesn't take much to get it right as long as you do the research and find the right property, then you know, our job here is done, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we made it achievable for people. They can understand two properties, one renovation, doesn't have to be 130 properties in three and a half years. You know, no. it can be. It can be something achievable. So thank you so much. I appreciate your time and um, okay. good luck with um, the webinars and everything like that. Okay. All the, all the best to all your people. Thank you.